The Last Apprentice, The Revenge of the Witch, Disc 3. Chapter 8, Old Mother Malkin. Back at the spook's cottage, I began to worry, but the more I thought about it, the less clear I was in my own mind. I knew what the spook would say. He'd throw the cakes away and give me a long lesson on witches and problems with girls wearing pointy shoes. He wasn't here, so that didn't enter into it. There were two things that made me go into the darkness of the eastern garden where he kept the witches. The first was my promise to Alice. Never make a promise that you're not prepared to keep, my dad always told me. So I had little choice. He taught me right from wrong, and just because I was the spook's apprentice, it didn't mean I'd change all my ways. Second, I didn't hold with keeping an old woman as a prisoner in a hole in the ground. Doing that to a dead witch seemed reasonable, but not to a live one. I remember wondering what terrible crime she'd committed to deserve that. What harm could it do just to give her three cakes? A bit of comfort from her family against the cold and damp, that's all it was. The spook had told me to trust my instincts, and after weighing things in the balance, I felt that I was doing the right thing. The only problem was that I had to take the cakes myself at midnight. It gets pretty dark by then especially if there's no moon visible. I approached the eastern garden carrying the basket. It was dark, but not quite as dark as I'd expected. For one thing, my eyes have always been pretty sharp at night. My mam's good in the dark, and I think I get it from her side. And for another, it was a cloudless night, and the moonlight helped me pick out my way. As I entered the trees, it suddenly grew colder, and I shivered. By the time I reached the first grave, the one with the stone border and the thirteen bars, I felt even colder. That was where the first witch was buried. She was feeble, with little strength, or so the spook had said. No need to worry there, I told myself, trying hard to believe it. Making up my mind to give Mother Malkin the cakes and daylight was one thing, but now, down in the garden, close to midnight, I was no longer so sure. The spook had told me to keep well away after dark. He'd warned me more than once, so it had to be an important rule, and now I was breaking it. There were all sorts of faint sounds. The rustlings and twitchings were probably nothing, just small creatures I'd disturbed moving out of my path, but they reminded me that I'd no right to be here. The spook had told me that the other two witches were about twenty paces farther on, so I counted out my steps carefully. That brought me to a second grave that was just like the first one. I got closer just to be sure. There were the bars, and you could see the earth just beneath them, hard-packed soil without even a single blade of grass. This witch was dead, but was still dangerous. She was the one who had been buried head downward. That meant that the soles of her feet were somewhere just below the soil. As I stared at the grave, I thought I saw something move. It was a sort of twitch, probably just my imagination, or maybe some small animal, a mouse, or a shrew or something. I moved on quickly. What if it had been a toe? Three more paces brought me to the place I was looking for. There was no doubt about it. Again, there was a border of stones with thirteen bars. There were three differences, though. First, the area under the bars was a square rather than an oblong. Second, it was bigger, probably about four paces by four. Third, there was no packed earth under the bars, just a very black hole in the ground. I halted in my tracks and listened carefully. There hadn't been much noise so far, just the faint rustlings of night creatures and a gentle breeze. A breeze so light that I'd hardly noticed it. I noticed it when it stopped, though. Suddenly everything was very still, and the woods became unnaturally quiet. You see, I had been listening to try and hear the witch, and now I sensed that she was listening to me. The silence seemed to go on and on forever, until suddenly I became aware of a faint breathing from the pit. That sound somehow made it possible to move so I took a few more steps till I was standing very close to its edge with the toe of my boot actually touching the stone border. At that moment, I remembered something the spook had told me about Mother Malkin. Most of her powers bled away into the earth. She'd love to get her hands on a lad like you. So I took a step backward. Not too far, but the spook's words had set me thinking. What if a hand came out of the pit and grabbed my ankle? Wanting to get it over with, I called down gently into the darkness. Mother Malkin, I said, I've brought something for you. It's a present from your family. Are you there? Are you listening? 
There was no reply, but the rhythm of the breathing below seemed to quicken. So wasting no more time and desperate to get back to the warmth of the spook's house, I reached into the basket and felt under the cloth. My fingers closed upon one of the cakes. It felt sort of soft and squishy and a bit sticky. I pulled it out and held it over the bars. It's just a cake, I said softly. I hope it makes you feel better. I'll bring you another one tomorrow night. With those words, I let go of the cake and allowed it to fall into the darkness. I should have gone back to the cottage immediately, but I stayed for a few more seconds to listen. I don't know what I expected to hear, but it was a mistake. There was a movement in the pit, as if something were dragging itself along the ground. And then I heard the witch begin to eat the cake. I thought some of my brothers made unpleasant noises at the table, but this was far worse. It sounded even more revolting than our big hairy pigs with their snouts in the swill bucket, a mixture of snuffling, snorting, and chewing mixed with heavy breathing. I didn't know whether or not she was enjoying the cake, but she certainly made enough noise about it. That night I found it very hard to sleep. I kept thinking about the dark pit and worrying about having to visit it again the following night. I only just made it down to breakfast on time, and the bacon was burned, and the bread a bit on the stale side. I couldn't understand why this was. I'd bought the bread fresh from the baker's only the day before. Not only that, the milk was sour. Could it be because the boggart was angry with me? Did it know what I'd been up to? Had it spoiled the breakfast as some sort of warning? Working on a farm is hard, and that was what I was used to. The spook hadn't left me any tasks to do, so I would nothing to fill my day with. I did walk up to the library, thinking that he probably wouldn't mind if I found myself something useful to read, but to my disappointment, the door was locked. So what could I do but go for a walk? I decided to explore the fells, first climbing Parlick Pike. At the summit, I sat on the cairn of stones and admired the view. It was a clear, bright day, and from up there I could see the county spread out below me, with the distant sea and inviting, twinkling blue way out to the northwest. The fells seemed to go on forever. Great hills with names like Calder Fell and Steakhouse Fell, so many that it seemed it would take a lifetime to explore them. Nearby was Wolf Fell, and it made me wonder whether there actually were any wolves in the area. Wolves could be dangerous, and it was said that in winter, when the weather was cold, they sometimes hunted in packs. Well, it was spring now, and I certainly didn't see any sign of them, but that didn't mean they weren't there. It made me realize that being up on the fells after nightfall would be quite scary. Not as scary, I decided, as having to go and feed Mother Malkin another of the cakes. And all too soon, the sun began to sink into the west, and I was forced to climb down toward Chippenden again. Once more, I found myself carrying the basket through the darkness of the garden. This time, I decided to get it over with quickly. Wasting no time, I dropped the second sticky cake through the bars into the black pit. It was only when it was too late, the very second it left my fingers, that I noticed something that sent a chill straight to my heart. The bars above the pit had been bent. Last night they'd been perfectly straight, thirteen parallel rods of iron. Now the center ones were almost wide enough to get a head through. They could have been bent by someone on the outside, above ground, but I doubted that. The spook had told me that the gardens and house were guarded and that nobody could get in. He hadn't said how and by what, but I guessed it was by some sort of boggart. Perhaps the same one that made the meals. So it had to be the witch. She must have climbed up the side of the pit somehow and begun working at the bars. Suddenly, the truth of what was happening dawned inside my head. I'd been so stupid. The cakes were making her stronger. I heard her below in the darkness starting to eat the second cake, making the same horrible chewing, snuffling, and snorting noises. I left the trees quickly and went back to the cottage. For all I knew, she might not even need the third one. After another sleepless night, I'd made up my mind. I decided to go and see Alice, give her back the last cake, and explain to her why I couldn't keep my promise. First, I had to find her. Straight after breakfast, I went down to the wood where we'd first met and walked through to its far edge. Alice had said she lived yonder, but there was no sign of any buildings, just low hills and valleys and more woods in the distance. Thinking it would be faster to ask directions, I went down into the village. There were surprisingly few people about, but as I'd expected, some of the lads were hanging about near the bakers. It seemed to be their favorite spot. Perhaps they liked the smell. I know I did. Freshly baked bread has one of the best smells in all the world. 
They weren't very friendly, considering that last time we'd met, I'd given them a cake and an apple each. That was probably because this time the big lad with piggy eyes was with them. Still, they did listen to what I had to say. I didn't go into details. Just told them I needed to find the girl we'd met at the edge of the wood. I know where she might be, said the big lad, scowling fiercely. But you'd be stupid to go there. Why's that? Didn't you hear what she said? He asked, raising his eyebrows. She said Bony Lizzie was her aunt. Who's Bony Lizzie? They looked at one another and shook their heads as if I was mad. Why was it that everyone seemed to have heard of her but me? Lizzie and her grandmother spent a whole winter here before Gregory sorted them out. My dad's always going on about them. They were just about the scariest witches there have ever been in these parts. They lived with something just as scary, though. It looked like a man, but it was really big, with too many teeth to fit in its mouth. That's what my dad told me. He said that back then, during that long winter, people never went out after dark. Some spook you'll be if you've never even heard of Bony Lizzie. I didn't like the sound of that one little bit. I realized I'd been really stupid. If only I'd told the spook about my talk with Alice, he'd have realized that Lizzie was back and would have done something about it. According to the big lad's dad, Bony Lizzie had lived on a farm about three miles southeast of the spook's place. It had been deserted for years, and nobody ever went there. So that was the most likely place she'd be staying now. That seemed about right to me, because it was in the direction that Alice had pointed. Just then a group of grim-faced people came out of the church. They turned the corner in a straggly line and headed up the hill toward the fells, the village priest in the lead. They were dressed in warm clothing, and many of them were carrying walking sticks. What's all that about? I asked. A child went missing last night answered one of the lads, spitting under the cobbles. A three-year-old. I think he's wandered off up there. Mind you, it's not the first. Two days ago, a baby went missing from a farm over on Long Ridge. It was too young to walk, so it must have been carried off. They think it could be wolves. It was a bad winter, and that sometimes brings them back. The directions I was given turned out to be pretty good. Even allowing for going back to pick up Alice's basket, it was less than an hour before Lizzie's house came into view. At that point, in bright sunlight, I lifted the cloth and examined the last of the three cakes. It smelled bad, but looked even worse. It seemed to have been made from small pieces of meat and bread, plus other things that I couldn't identify. It was wet and very sticky and almost black. None of the ingredients had been cooked, but just sort of pressed together. Then I noticed something even more horrible. There were tiny white things crawling on the cake that looked like maggots. I shuddered, covered it up with the cloth, and went down the hill to the very neglected farm. Fences were broken, a barn was missing half its roof, and there was no sign of any animals. One thing did worry me, though. Smoke was coming from the farmhouse chimney. It meant that someone was at home, and I began to worry about the thing with too many teeth to fit into its mouth. What had I expected? It was going to be difficult. How on earth could I manage to talk to Alice without being seen by the other members of her family? As I halted on the slope, trying to work out what to do next, my problem was solved for me. A slim, dark figure came out of the back door of the farmhouse and began to climb the hill in my direction. It was Alice, but how had she known I was there? There were trees between the farmhouse and me, and the windows were facing in the wrong direction. Still, she wasn't coming up the hill by chance. She walked straight up toward me and halted about five paces away. What do you want? she asked. You're stupid coming here. Lucky for you that those inside are asleep. I can't do what you asked, I said, holding out the basket toward her. She folded her arms and frowned. Why not? she demanded. You promised, didn't you? You didn't tell me what would happen, I said. She's eaten two cakes already, and they're making her stronger. She's already bent the bars over the pit. One more cake and she'll be free, and I think you know it. Wasn't that the idea all along? I accused, starting to feel angry. You tricked me, so the promise doesn't count anymore. She took a step nearer, but now her own anger had been replaced by something else. Suddenly, she looked scared. It wasn't my idea. They made me do it, she said, gesturing down toward the farmhouse. If you don't do as you promised, it'll go hard with both of us. Go on, give her the third cake. What harm can it do? Mother Malkin's paid the price. It's time to let her go. Go on. Give her the cake and she'll be gone tonight and never trouble you again. 
I think Mr. Gregory must have had a very good reason for putting her in that pit, I said slowly. I'm just his new apprentice, so how can I know what's best? When he gets back, I'm going to tell him everything that's happened. Alice gave a little smile, the sort of smile someone gives when they know something that you don't. He ain't coming back, she said. Lizzie thought of it all. Got good friends near Pendle, Lizzie has. Do anything for her, they would. They tricked old Gregory. When he's on the road, he'll get what's coming to him. For now, he's probably already dead and six feet under. You just wait and see if I'm right. Soon, you won't be safe even up there in his house. One night they'll come for you. Unless, of course, you help now. In that case, they might just leave you alone. As soon as she'd said that, I turned my back and climbed the hill, leaving her standing there. I think she called out to me several times, but I wasn't listening. What she'd said about the spook was spinning around inside my head. It was only later that I realized I was still carrying the basket, so I threw it and the last of the cakes into a river. Then, back at the spook's cottage, it didn't take me very long to work out what had happened and decide what to do next. The whole thing had been planned from the start. They'd lured the spook away, knowing that, as a new apprentice, I'd still be wet behind the ears and easy to trick. I didn't believe that the spook would be so easy to kill, or he wouldn't have survived for so many years, but I couldn't rely on him arriving back in time to help me. Somehow, I had to stop Mother Malkin from getting out of the pit. I needed help badly, and I thought of going down to the village, but I knew there was a more special kind of help near at hand. So I went into the kitchen and sat at the table. At any moment, I expected to have my ears boxed, so I talked quickly. I explained everything that had happened, leaving nothing out. Then I said that it was my fault, and could I please be given some help? I don't know what I expected. I didn't feel foolish talking to the empty air because I was so upset and frightened, but as the silence lengthened, I gradually realized that I'd been wasting my time. Why should the boggart help me? For all I knew, it was a prisoner, bound to the house and garden by the spook. It might just be a slave, desperate to be free. It might even be happy because I was in trouble. Just when I was about to give up and leave the kitchen, I remembered something my dad often said before he went off to the local market. Everyone has his price. It's just a case of making an offer that pleases him, but doesn't hurt you too much. So I made the boggart an offer. If you help me now, I won't forget it, I said. When I become the next spook, I'll give you every Sunday off. On that day, I'll make my own meals so that you can have a rest and please yourself what you do. Suddenly, I felt something brush against my legs under the table. There was a noise, too, a faint purring, and a big ginger cat strolled into view and moved slowly toward the door. It must have been under the table all the time. That's what common sense told me. I knew different, though. So I followed the cat out into the hallway and then up the stairs, where it halted outside the locked door of the library. Then it rubbed its back against it, the way cats do against table legs. The door slowly swung open to reveal more books than anyone could ever have read in one lifetime, arranged neatly on rows of parallel racks of shelves. I stepped inside, wondering where to begin, and when I turned around again, the big ginger cat had vanished. Each book had its title neatly displayed on the cover. A lot were written in Latin and quite a few in Greek. There was no dust or cobwebs. The library was just as clean and well cared for as the kitchen. I walked along the first row until something caught my eye. Near the window there were three very long shelves full of leather-bound notebooks, just like the one the spook had given me. But the top shelf had larger books with dates on the covers. Each one seemed to record a period of five years, so I picked up the one at the end of the shelf and opened it carefully. I recognized the spook's handwriting. Flicking through the pages, I realized that it was a sort of diary. It recorded each job he'd done, the time taken in traveling, and the amount he'd been paid. Most importantly, it explained just how each boggart, ghost, and witch had been dealt with. I put the book back on the shelf and glanced along the other spines. The diaries extended almost up to the present day, but went back hundreds of years. Either the spook was a lot older than he looked, or the earlier books had been written by other spooks who'd lived ages ago. I suddenly wondered whether, even if Alice was right and the spook didn't come back, there was a possibility that I might be able to learn all I needed to know just by studying those diaries. Better still, somewhere in those thousands upon thousands of pages, there might be information that would help me now. How could I find it? Well, it might take time, but the witch had been in the pit for almost 13 years. 
there had to be an account of how the spook had put her there. Then, suddenly, on a lower shelf, I saw something even better. There were even bigger books, each dedicated to a particular topic. One was labeled Dragons and Worms. As they were displayed in alphabetical order, it didn't take me long to find just what I was looking for. Witches. I opened it with trembling hands to find it was divided into four predictable sections. The malevolent, the benign, the falsely accused, and the unaware. I quickly turned to the first section. Everything was in the spook's neat handwriting and once again carefully organized into alphabetical order. Within seconds I found a page titled Mother Malkin. It was worse than I'd expected. Mother Malkin was just about as evil as you could imagine. She lived in lots of places, and in each area she'd stayed, something terrible had happened, the worst thing of all occurring on a moss to the west of the county. She'd lived on a farm there, offering a place to stay to young women who were expecting babies but had no husbands to support them. That was where she'd gotten the title Mother. This had gone on for years, but some of the young women had never been seen again. She'd had a son of her own living with her there, a young man of incredible strength called Tusk. He had big teeth and frightened people so much that nobody ever went near the place. But at last the locals had roused themselves and Mother Malkin had been forced to flee to Pendle. After she'd gone, they found the first of the graves. There was a whole field of bones and rotting flesh, mainly the remains of the children she'd murdered to supply her need for blood. Some of the bodies were those of women, in each case, the body had been crushed, the ribs broken or cracked. The lads in the village had talked about a thing with too many teeth to fit in its mouth. Could that be Tusk, Mother Malkin's son? A son who'd probably killed those women by crushing the life out of them? That set my hands trembling so much that I could hardly hold the book steady enough to read it. It seemed that some witches used bone magic. They were necromancers who got their power by summoning the dead. But Mother Malkin was even worse. Mother Malkin used blood magic. She got her power by using human blood and was particularly fond of the blood of children. I thought of the black sticky cakes and shuddered. A child had gone missing from the Long Ridge, a child too young to walk. Had it been snatched by Bony Lizzie? Had its blood been used to make those cakes? And what about the second child, the one the villagers were searching for? What if Bony Lizzie had snatched that one too? ready for when Mother Malkin escaped from her pit so that she could use its blood to work her magic. The child might be in Lizzie's house now. I forced myself to go on reading. Thirteen years ago, early in the winter, Mother Malkin had come to live in Chippenden, bringing her granddaughter, Bony Lizzie, with her. When he'd come back from his winter house in Angle's Ark, the spook had wasted no time in dealing with her. After driving off Bony Lizzie, he'd bound Mother Malkin with a silver chain and carried her back to the pit in his garden. The spook seemed to be arguing with himself in the account. He clearly didn't like burying her alive, but explained why it had to be done. He believed that it was too dangerous to kill her. Once slain, she had the power to return, and would be even stronger and more dangerous than before. The point was, could she still escape? One cake, and she'd been able to bend the bars. Although she wouldn't get the third, two might just be enough. At midnight, she might still climb out of the pit. What could I do? If you could bind a witch with a silver chain, then it might have been worth trying to fasten one across the top of the bent bars to stop her from climbing out of her pit. The trouble was, the spook silver chain was in his bag, which always traveled with him. I saw something else as I left that library. It was beside the door, so I hadn't noticed it as I came in. It was a long list of names on yellow paper, exactly thirty, and all written in the spook's own handwriting. My own name, Thomas J. Ward, was at the very bottom, and directly above it was the name William Bradley, which had been crossed out with a horizontal line. Next to it were the letters R.I.P. I felt cold all over then, because I knew that they meant rest in peace and that Billy Bradley had died. More than two-thirds of the names on the paper had been crossed off. Of those, nine besides Billy were dead. I supposed that a lot were crossed out simply because they'd failed to make the grade as apprentices, perhaps not even making it to the end of the first month. Those who had died were more worrying. I wondered what had happened to Billy Bradley, and I remembered what Alice had said. Don't want to end up like old Gregory's last apprentice. How did Alice know what had happened to Billy? 
It was probably just that everybody in the locality knew about it while I was an outsider. Or had her family had something to do with it? I hope not, but it gave me something else to worry about. Wasting no more time, I went down to the village. The butcher seemed to have some contact with the spook. How else had he gotten the sack to put the meat into? So I decided to tell him about my suspicions and try to persuade him to search Lizzie's house for the missing child. It was late in the afternoon when I arrived at his shop and it was closed. I knocked on the doors of five cottages before anyone came to answer. They confirmed what I already suspected. The butcher had gone off with the other men to search the fells. They wouldn't be back until noon the following day. It seemed that after searching the local fells, they were going to cross the valley to the village at the foot of the long ridge where the first child had gone missing. There, they'd carry out a wider search and stay overnight. I had to face it. I was on my own. Soon, both sad and afraid, I was climbing the lane back toward the spook's house. I knew that if Mother Malkin got out of her grave, then the child would be dead before morning. I also knew that I was the only one who might even try to do something about it. Chapter 9. On the River Bank Back at the cottage, I went to the room where the spook kept his walking clothes. I chose one of his old cloaks. It was too big, of course, and the hem came down almost to my ankles, while the hood kept falling down over my eyes. Still, it would keep out the worst of the cold. I borrowed one of his staffs, too, the one most useful to me as a walking stick. It was shorter than the others and slightly thicker at one end. When I finally left the cottage, it was close to midnight. The sky was bright, and there was a full moon just rising above the trees, but I could smell rain, and the wind was freshening from the west. I walked out into the garden and headed directly for Mother Malkin's pit. I was afraid, but someone had to do it, and who else was there but me? It was all my fault anyway. If only I'd told the spook about meeting Alice and what she'd told the lads about Lizzie being back, he could have sorted it all out then. He wouldn't have been lured away to Pendle. The more I thought about it, the worse it got. The child on the long ridge might not have died. I felt guilty, so guilty, and I couldn't stand the thought that another child might die and that would be my fault too. I passed the second grave, where the dead witch was buried head down and moved very slowly forward on my tiptoes until I reached the pit. A shaft of moonlight fell through the trees to light it up, so there was no doubt about what had happened. I was too late. The bars had been bent even farther apart, almost into the shape of a circle. Even the butcher could have eased his massive shoulders through that gap. I peered down into the blackness of the pit but couldn't see anything. I suppose I had a forlorn hope that she might have exhausted herself bending the bars and was now too tired to climb out. Fat chance. At that moment, a cloud drifted across the moon, making things a lot darker. But I could see the bent ferns. I could see the direction she'd taken. There was enough light to follow her trail. So I followed her into the gloom. I wasn't moving too quickly, and I was being very, very cautious. What if she was hiding and waiting for me just ahead? I also knew that she probably hadn't gotten very far. For one thing, it wasn't more than five minutes or so after midnight. Whatever was in the cakes she'd eaten, I knew that dark magic would have played some part in getting her strength back. It was a magic that was supposed to be more powerful during the hours of darkness, particularly at midnight. She'd only eaten two cakes, not three, so that was in my favor, but I thought of the terrible strength needed to bend those bars. Once out of the trees, I found it easy to follow her trail through the grass. She was heading downhill, but in a direction that would take her away from Boney Lizzie's cottage. That puzzled me at first, until I remembered the river and the gully below. A malevolent witch couldn't cross running water. The spook had taught me that, so she would have to move along its banks until it curved back upon itself, leaving her way clear. Once in sight of the river, I paused on the hillside and searched the land below. The moon came out from behind a cloud, but at first, even with its help, I couldn't see anything much down by the river because there were trees on both banks, casting dark shadows. And then, suddenly I noticed something very strange. There was a silver trail on the near bank. It was only visible where the moon touched it, but it looked just like the glistening trail made by a snail. A few seconds later, I saw a dark, shadowy thing all hunched up, shuffling along very close to the river bank. I started off down the hill as quickly as I could. My intention was to cut her off before she reached the bend in the river and was able to head directly for Boney Lizzie's place. 
I managed that and stood there, the river on my right, facing downstream. But next came the difficult part. Now I had to face the witch. I was trembling and shaking and so out of breath that you'd have thought I'd spent an hour or so running up and down the fells. It was a mixture of fear and nerves, and my knees felt as if they were going to give way any minute. It was only by leaning heavily on the spook's staff that I was able to stay on my feet at all. As rivers went, it wasn't that wide, but it was deep, swollen by the spring rains to a level where it had almost burst its banks. The water was moving fast, too, rushing away from me into the darkness beneath the trees where the witch was. I looked very carefully, but it still took me quite a few moments to find her. Mother Malkin was moving in my direction. She was a shadow darker than the tree shadows, a sort of blackness that you could fall into, a darkness that would swallow you up forever. I heard her then, even above the noise made by the fast-flowing river. It wasn't just the sound of her bare feet, which were making a sort of slithery noise as they moved toward me through the long grass at the stream's edge. No, there were other sounds that she was making with her mouth and perhaps her nose, the same sort of noises she'd made when I'd fed her the cake. There were snortings and snufflings that once again brought into my mind the memory of our hairy pigs feeding from the swill bucket. Then a different sound, a sucking noise. When she moved out from under the trees into the open, the moonlight fell on her, and I saw her properly for the first time. Her head was bowed low, her face hidden by a tangled mass of white and gray hair, so it seemed that she was looking at her feet, which were just visible under the dark gown that came down to her ankles. She wore a black cloak, too, and either it was too long for her or the years she had spent in the damp earth had made her shrink. It hung down to the ground behind her, and it was this, dragging over the grass, that seemed to be making the silver trail. Her gown was stained and torn, which wasn't really surprising, but some were fresh stains, dark, wet patches. Something was dripping onto the grass at her side, and the drips were coming from what she gripped tightly in her left hand. It was a rat. She was eating a rat. Eating it raw. She didn't seem to have noticed me yet. She was very close now, and if nothing happened, she'd bump right into me. I coughed suddenly. It wasn't to warn her. It was a nervous cough, and I hadn't meant it to happen. She looked up at me then, lifting into the moonlight a face that was something out of a nightmare. A face that didn't belong to a living person. Oh, but she was alive, all right. You could tell that by the noises she was making eating that rat. But there was something else about her that terrified me so much that I almost fainted away on the spot. It was her eyes. They were like two hot coals burning inside their sockets. Two red points of fire. And then she spoke to me. Her voice, something between a whisper and a croak. It sounded like dry, dead leaves rustling together in a late autumn wind. It's a boy. I like boys. Come here, boy. I didn't move, of course. I just stood there, rooted to the spot. I felt dizzy and lightheaded. She was still moving toward me, and her eyes seemed to be growing larger. Not only her eyes, her whole body seemed to be swelling up. She was expanding into a vast cloud of darkness that within moments would darken my own eyes forever. Without thinking, I lifted the spook staff. My hands and arms did it, not me. What's that, boy? A wand? She croaked. Then she chuckled to herself and dropped the dead rat, lifting both her arms toward me. It was me she wanted. She wanted my blood. In absolute terror, my body began to sway from side to side. I was like a sapling, agitated by the first stirrings of a wind, the first storm wind of a dark winter that would never end. I could have died then, on the bank of that river. There was nobody to help, and I felt powerless to help myself. But suddenly, it happened. The spook staff wasn't a wand, but there's more than one kind of magic. My arms conjured up something special, moving faster than I could even think. They lifted the staff and swung it hard, catching the witch a terrible blow on the side of the head. She gave a sort of grunt and fell sideways into the river. There was a big splash, and she went right under but came up very close to the bank, about five or six paces downstream. At first I thought that that was the end of her, 
But to my horror, her left arm came out of the water and grabbed a tussock of grass. Then the other arm reached for the bank, and she started to drag herself out of the water. I knew I had to do something before it was too late, so using all my willpower, I forced myself to take a step toward her as she heaved more of her body up onto the bank. When I got close enough, I did something that I can still remember vividly. I still have nightmares about it, but what choice did I have? It was her or me. Only one of us was going to survive. I jabbed the witch with the end of the staff. I jabbed her hard and kept on jabbing her until she finally lost her grip on the bank and was swept away into the darkness. But it still wasn't over. What if she managed to get out of the water farther downstream? She could still go to Bony Lizzie's house. I had to make sure that didn't happen. I knew it was the wrong thing to kill her and that one day she'd probably come back stronger than ever. But I didn't have a silver chain, so I couldn't bind her. It was now that mattered, not the future. No matter how hard it was, I knew I had to follow the river into the trees. Very slowly I began to walk along the riverbank, pausing every five or six steps to listen. All I could hear was the wind sighing faintly through the branches above. It was very dark, with only the occasional thin shaft of moonlight managing to penetrate the leaf canopy, each like a long silver spear embedded in the ground. The third time I paused, it happened. There was no warning. I didn't hear a thing. I simply felt it. A hand slithered up onto my boot, and before I could move away, it gripped my left ankle hard. I felt the strength in that grip. It was as if my ankle were being crushed. When I looked down, all I could see was a pair of red eyes glaring up at me out of the darkness. Terrified, I jabbed down blindly toward the unseen hand that was clutching my ankle. I was too late. My ankle was jerked violently and I fell to the ground, the impact driving all the breath from my body. What was worse, the staff went flying from my hand, leaving me defenseless. I lay there for a moment or two, trying to catch my breath, until I felt myself being dragged toward the river bank. When I heard the splashing, I knew what was happening. Mother Malkin was using me to drag herself out of the river. The witch's legs were thrashing about in the water, and I knew that one of two things would happen. Either she'd manage to get out, or I'd end up in the river with her. Desperate to escape, I rolled over to my left, twisting my ankle away. She held on, so I rolled again and came to a halt with my face pressed against the damp earth. Then I saw the staff, its thicker end lying in a shaft of moonlight. It was out of reach, about three or four paces away. I rolled toward it, rolled again and again, digging my fingers into the soft earth, twisting my body like a corkscrew. Mother Malkin had a tight grip on my ankle, but that was all she had. The lower half of her body was still in the water, so despite her great strength, she couldn't stop me from rolling over and twisting her through the water after me. At last I reached the staff and thrust it hard at the witch, but her own hand moved into the moonlight and gripped the other end. I thought it was over then. I thought that was the end of me. But to my surprise, Mother Malkin suddenly screamed very loudly. Her whole body became rigid, and her eyes rolled up in her head. Then she gave a long, deep sigh and became very still. We both lay there on the riverbank for what seemed a long time, only my chest was rising and falling as I gulped in air. Mother Malkin wasn't moving at all. When finally she did, it wasn't to take a breath. Very slowly, one hand let go of my ankle, and the other released the staff, and she slid down the bank into the river, entering the water with hardly a splash. I didn't know what had happened, but she was dead. I was sure of it. I watched her body being carried away from the bank by the current and swirled right into the middle of the river. Still lit by the moon, her head went under. She was gone. Dead and gone. Chapter 10 Poor Billy I was so weak afterward that I fell to my knees, and within moments I was sick. Sicker than I'd ever been before. I kept heaving and heaving even when there was nothing but bile coming out of my mouth, heaving until my insides felt torn and twisted. At last it ended. And I managed to stand. Even then, it was a long time before my breathing slowed down and my body stopped trembling. I just wanted to go back to the spook's house. I'd done enough for one night, surely. But I couldn't. The child was in Lizzie's house. That was what my instincts told me. The child was the prisoner of a witch who was capable of murder. So I had no choice. 
There was nobody else but me. And if I didn't help, then who would? I had to set off for Boney Lizzie's house. There was a storm surging in from the west, a dark, jagged line of cloud that was eating into the stars. Very soon now it would begin to rain, but as I started down the hill toward the house, the moon was still out, a full moon, bigger than I ever remembered it. It was casting my shadow before me as I went. I watched it grow, and the nearer I got to the house, the bigger it seemed to get. I had my hood up, and I was carrying the spook staff in my left hand, so that the shadow didn't seem to belong to me anymore. It moved on ahead of me until it fell upon Boney Lizzie's house. I glanced backward then, half expecting to see the spook standing behind me. He wasn't there. It was just a trick of the light, so I went on until I'd passed through the open gate into the yard. I paused before the front door to think. What if I was too late and the child was already dead? Or what if its disappearance was nothing to do with Lizzie and I was just putting myself in danger for nothing? My mind carried on thinking, but just as it had on the riverbank, my body knew what to do. Before I could stop it, my left hand wrapped the staff hard against the wood three times. For a few moments there was silence, followed by the sound of footsteps and a sudden crack of light under the door. As the door swung slowly open, I took a step backward. To my relief, it was Alice. She was holding a lantern level with her head so that one half of her face was lit while the other was in darkness. What do you want? She asked, her voice filled with anger. You know what I want, I replied. I've come for the child, for the child that you've stolen. Don't be a fool, she said. Go away before it's too late. They've gone off to meet Mother Mulgan. They could be back any minute. Suddenly, a child began to cry, a thin wail coming from somewhere inside the house, so I pushed past Alice and went inside. There was just a single candle flickering in the narrow passageway, but the rooms themselves were in darkness. The candle was unusual. I'd never seen one made of black wax before, but I snatched it up anyway and let my ears guide me to the right room. I eased open the door. The room was empty of furniture, and the child was lying on the floor on a heap of straw and rags. What's your name? I asked, trying my best to smile. I leaned my staff against the wall and moved closer. The child stopped crying and tottered to its feet, its eyes very wide. Don't worry. There's no need to be scared, I said, trying to put as much reassurance into my voice as possible. I'm going to take you home to your ma'am. I put the candle on the floor and picked up the child. It smelled as bad as the rest of the room, and it was cold and wet. I cradled it with my right arm and wrapped my cloak about it as best I could. Suddenly the child spoke. I'm Tommy, it said. I'm Tommy. Well, Tommy, I said, we've got the same name. My name's Tommy, too. You're safe now. You're going home. With those words, I picked up my staff and went into the passageway and out through the front door. Alice was standing in the yard near the gate. The lantern had gone out, but the moon was still shining, and as I walked nearer, it threw my shadow onto the side of the barn, a giant shadow, ten times bigger than I was. I tried to pass her, but she stepped directly into my path so that I was forced to halt. Don't meddle, she warned, her voice almost a snarl, her teeth gleaming white and sharp in the moonlight. Ain't none of your business, this. I was in no mood to waste time arguing with her, and when I moved directly toward her, Alice didn't try to stop me. She stepped back out of my way and called after me. You're a fool. Give it back before it's too late. They'll come after you. You'll never get away. I didn't bother to answer. I never even looked back. I went through the gate and began to climb away from the house. It started to rain then, hard and heavy, straight into my face. It was the kind of rain that my dad used to call wet rain. All rain is wet, of course, but some kinds do seem to make a better and faster job of soaking you than others. This was as wet as it got, and I headed back toward the spook's house as fast as I could. I wasn't sure if I'd be safe even there. What if the spook really was dead? Would the boggart still guard his house and garden? Soon, I had more immediate things to worry about. I began to sense that I was being followed. The first time I felt it, I came to a halt and listened. But there was nothing but the howling of the wind and the rain lashing into the trees and drumming onto the earth. I couldn't see much either, because it was very dark now. So I carried on, taking even bigger strides, just hoping that I was still heading in the right direction. Once I came up against a thick, high hawthorn hedge and had to make a long detour to find a gate, all the time feeling that the danger behind was getting closer. 
It was just after I'd come through a small wood that I knew for certain there was someone there. Climbing a hill, I paused for breath close to its summit. The rain had eased for a moment, and I looked back down into the darkness toward the trees. I heard the crack and snap of twigs. Someone was moving very fast through the wood in my direction, not caring where he put his feet. At the crest of the hill, I looked back once more. The first flash of lightning lit up the sky and the ground below, and I saw two figures come out of the trees and begin to climb the slope. One of them was female, the other shaped like a man, big and burly. When the thunder crashed again, Tommy began to cry. Don't like thunder, he wailed. Don't like thunder. Storms can't hurt you, Tommy, I told him, knowing it wasn't true. They scared me as well. One of my uncles had been struck by lightning when he'd been out trying to get some cattle in. He'd died later. It wasn't safe being out in the open in weather like this. But although lightning terrified me, it did have its uses. It was showing me the way, each vivid flash lighting up my route back to the spook's house. Soon the breath was sobbing in my throat, too, a mixture of fear and exhaustion as I forced myself to go faster and faster, just hoping that we'd be safe as soon as we entered the spook's garden. Nobody was allowed on the spook's property unless invited. I kept telling myself that over and over again because it was our only chance. If we could just get there first, the boggart would protect us. I was in sight of the trees, the bench beneath them, the garden waiting beyond when I slipped on the wet grass. The fall wasn't hard, but Tommy began to cry even louder. When I'd managed to pick him up, I heard someone running behind me, feet thumping the earth. I glanced back, struggling for breath. It was a mistake. My pursuer was about five or six paces ahead of Lizzie and catching me fast. Lightning flashed again, and I saw the lower half of his face. It looked as if he had horns growing out each side of his mouth, and as he ran, he moved his head from side to side. I remembered what I'd read in the spook's library about the dead women who'd been found with their ribs crushed. If Tusk caught me, he'd do the same to me. For a moment, I was rooted to the spot, but he started to make a bellowing sound, just like a bull, and that started me moving again. I was almost running now. I would have sprinted if I could, but I was carrying Tommy and I was too weary, my legs heavy and sluggish, the breath rasping in my throat. At any moment I expected to be grabbed from behind, but I passed the bench where the spook often gave me lessons, and then, at last, I was beneath the first trees of the garden. But was I safe? If I wasn't, it was all over for both of us, because there was no way I could outrun Tusk to the house. I stopped running, and all I could manage was a few steps before I came to a complete halt trying to regain my breath. It was at that moment that something brushed past my legs. I looked down, but it was too dark to see anything. First I felt the pressure, then I heard something purr, a deep throbbing sound that made the ground beneath my feet vibrate. I sensed it move on beyond me, toward the edge of the trees, positioning itself between us and those who'd been following. I couldn't hear any running now, but I heard something else. Imagine the angry howl of a tomcat multiplied a hundred times. It was a mixture between a throbbing growl and a scream, filling the air with its warning challenge, a sound that could have been heard for miles. It was the most terrifying and threatening sound I'd ever heard, and I knew then why the villagers never came anywhere near the spook's house. That cry was filled with death. Cross this line, it said and I'll rip out your heart. Cross this line, and I'll gnaw your bones to pulp and gore. Cross this line, and you'll wish you'd never been born. So for now, we were safe. By now, Bony Lizzie and Tusk would be running back down the hill. Nobody would be foolish enough to tangle with the spook's boggart. No wonder they needed me to feed Mother Malkin the blood cakes. There was hot soup, and a blazing fire waiting for us in the kitchen. I wrapped little Tommy in a warm blanket and fed him some soup. Later, I brought down a couple of pillows and made up a bed for him close to the fire. He slept like a log while I listened to the wind howling outside and the rain pattering against the windows. It was a long night, but I was warm and comfortable, and I felt at peace in the spook's house, which was one of the safest places in the whole wide world. I knew now that nothing unwelcome could even enter the garden, never mind cross the threshold. It was safer than a castle with high battlements and a wide moat. 
I began to think of the boggart as my friend, and a very powerful friend at that. Just before noon, I carried Tommy down to the village. The men were already back from the long ridge, and when I went to the butcher's house, the instant he saw the child, his weary frown turned into a broad smile. I briefly explained what had happened, only going into as much detail as was necessary. Once I'd finished, he'd frowned again. They need sorting out, once and for all, he said. I didn't stay long. After Tommy had been given to his mother, and she'd thanked me for the fifteenth time, it became obvious what was going to happen. By then, about thirty or so of the village men had gathered. Some of them were carrying clubs and stout sticks, and they were muttering angrily about stoning and burning. I knew that something had to be done, but I didn't want to be a part of it. Despite all that had happened, I couldn't stand the thought of Alice being hurt, so I went for a walk on the fells for an hour or so to clear my head before walking slowly back toward the spook's house. I'd decided to sit on the bench for a while and enjoy the afternoon sun, but someone was there already. It was the spook. He was safe, after all. Until that moment, I'd avoided thinking about what I was going to do next. I mean, how long would I have stayed in his house before deciding that he wasn't going to come back? Now it was all sorted out because there he was, staring across the trees to where a plume of brown smoke was rising. They were burning Bony Lizzie's house. When I got close to the bench, I noticed a big purple bruise over his left eye. He saw me glance at it and gave me a tired smile. We make a lot of enemies in this job, he said, and sometimes you need eyes in the back of your head. Still, things didn't work out too badly because now we've one less enemy to worry about near Pendle. Take a pew, he said, patting the bench at his side. What have you been up to? Tell me what's been happening here. Start at the beginning and finish at the end, leaving nothing out. So I did. I told him everything. When I'd finished, he stood up and looked down at me, his green eyes staring into mine very hard. I wish I'd known Lizzie was back. When I put Mother Malkin into the pit, Lizzie left in a bit of a hurry, and I didn't think she'd ever have the nerve to show her face again. You should have told me about meeting the girl. It would have saved everybody a lot of trouble. I looked down, unable to meet his eyes. What was the worst thing that happened? he asked. The memory came back, sharp and clear of the old witch grabbing my boot and trying to drag herself out of the water. I remembered her scream as she gripped the end of the spook staff. When I told him about it, he sighed long and deep. Are you sure she was dead? he asked. I shrugged. She wasn't breathing. Then her body was carried to the middle of the river and swept away. Well, it was a bad business, all right, he said. And the memory of it will stay with you for the rest of your life, but you'll just have to live with it. You were lucky in taking the smallest of my staffs with you. That's what saved you in the end. It's made of rowan, the most effective wood of all when dealing with witches. It wouldn't usually have bothered a witch that old and that strong, but she was in running water. So you were lucky, but you did all right for a new apprentice. You showed courage, real courage, and you saved a child's life. But you made two more serious mistakes. I bowed my head. I thought I'd probably made more than two, but I wasn't going to argue. Your most serious mistake was in killing that witch, the spook said. She should have been brought back here. Or the Malkin is so strong that she could even break free of her bones. It's very rare, but it can happen. Her spirit could be born into this world again, complete with all her memories. Then she'd come looking for you, lad, and she'd want revenge. That would take years, though, wouldn't it? I asked. A newborn baby can't do much. She'd have to grow up first. That's the worst part of it, the spook said. It could happen sooner than you think. Her spirit could seize someone else's body and use it as her own. It's called possession and it's a bad business for everybody concerned. After that, you'll never know when and from which direction the danger will come. She might possess the body of a young woman, a lass with a dazzling smile who win your heart before she takes your life. Or she might use her beauty to bend some strong man to her will, a knight or a judge who will have you thrown into a dungeon where you'll be at her mercy. Then again, time will be on her side. She might attack when I'm not here to help, Maybe years from now, when you're long past your prime, and your eyesight's failing and your joints are starting to creak. But there's another type of possession, one that's more likely in this case. 
Much more likely. You see, lad, there's a problem with keeping a live witch in a pit like that. Especially one so powerful, who spent her long life practicing blood magic. She'll have been eating worms and other slithery things with the wet constantly soaking into her flesh. So in the same way that a tree can slowly be petrified and turn into rock, her body will have been slowly starting to change. Gripping the rowan staff would have stopped her heart, pushing her over the barrier into death, and being washed away by the river might have speeded up the process. In this case, she'll still be bound to her bones, like most other malevolent witches, but because of her great strength, she'll be able to move her dead body. You see, lad, she'll be what we call wick. It's an old county word that you're no doubt familiar with. Just as a head of hair can be wick with lice, her dead body is now wick with her wicked spirit. It'll be heaving like a bowl of maggots, and she'll crawl, slither, or drag herself toward her chosen victim. And instead of being hard, like a petrified tree, her dead body will be soft and pliable, able to squeeze into the tiniest space, able to ooze up someone's nose or into his ear and possess his body. There are only two ways to make sure that a witch as powerful as Mother Malkin can't come back. The first is to burn her, but nobody should have to suffer pain like that. The other way is too horrible even to think about. It's a method few have heard about because it was practiced long ago in a land far away over the sea. According to their ancient books, if you eat the heart of a witch, she can never return, and you have to eat it raw. If we practice either method, we're no better than the witch we kill, said the spook. Both are barbaric. The only alternative left is the pit. That's cruel as well, but we do it to protect the innocents, those who'd be her future victims. Well, lad, one way or the other, now she's free. There's trouble ahead for sure, but there's little we can do about it now. We'll just have to be on our guard. I'll be all right, I said. I'll manage somehow. Well, you'd better start by learning how to manage a boggart, the spook said, shaking his head sadly. That was your other big mistake. A whole Sunday off every week? That's far too generous. Anyway, what should we do about that? He asked, gesturing toward a thin plume of smoke that was still just visible to the southeast. I shrugged. I suppose it'll be all over by now, I said. There were a lot of angry villagers, and they were talking about stoning. All over with? Don't you believe it, lad. A witch like Lizzie has a sense of smell better than any hunting dog. She can sniff out things before they happen, and would have been gone long before anyone got near. No, she'll have fled back to Pendle, where most of the brood live. We should follow now, but I've been on the road for days, and I'm too weary and sore and need to gather my strength. But we can't leave Lizzie free for too long, or she'll start to work her mischief again. I'll have to go after her before the end of the week, and you'll be coming with me. It won't be easy, but you might as well get used to the idea. But first things first, so follow me. As I followed, I noticed that he had a slight limp and was walking more slowly than usual. So whatever had happened on Pendle, it hadn't been without cost to himself. He led me into the house, up the stairs, and into the library halting beside the farthest shelves, the ones near the window. I like to keep my books in my library, he said, and I like my library to get bigger rather than smaller. But because of what's happened, I'm going to make an exception. He reached up and took a book from the very top shelf and handed it to me. You need this more than I do, he said. A lot more. As books went, it wasn't very big. It was even smaller than my notebook. Like most of the spook's books, it was bound in leather and had its title printed both on the front cover and on the spine. It said, Possession, the Damned, the Dizzy, and the Desperate. What does the title mean? I asked. What it says, lad. Exactly what it says. Read the book, and you'll find out. When I opened the book, I was disappointed. Inside, every word on every page was printed in Latin, a language I couldn't read. Study it well. And carry it with you at all times, said the spook. It's the definitive work. He must have seen me frowning, because he smiled and jabbed at the book with his finger. Definitive means that so far it's the best book that's ever been written about possession. 
But it's a very difficult subject, and it was written by a young man who still had a lot to learn. So it's not the last word on the subject, and there's more to discover. Turn to the back of the book. I did as he told me, and found that the last ten or so pages were blank. If you find out anything new, just write it down there. Every little bit helps. And don't worry about the fact that it's in Latin. I'll be starting your lessons as soon as we've eaten. We went for our afternoon meal, which was cooked almost to perfection. As I swallowed down my last mouthful, something moved under the table and began to rub itself against my legs. Suddenly the sound of purring could be heard. It gradually got louder and louder until all the plates and dishes on the sideboard began to rattle. No wonder it's happy, said the spook, shaking his head. One day off a year would have been nearer the mark. Still, not to worry. It's business as usual and life goes on. Bring your notebook with you, lad. We've a lot to get through today. So I followed the spook down the path to the bench, uncorked the bottle of ink, dipped in my pen, and prepared to take notes. Once they've passed the test in Horshaw, said the spook, starting to limp up and down in front of the bench, I usually try to ease my apprentices into the job as gently as possible. But now that you've been face to face with a witch, you know how difficult and dangerous the job can be. And I think you're ready to find out what happened to my last apprentice. It's linked to Bogots, a topic we've been studying, so you might as well learn from it. Find a clean page and write down this for a heading. I did as I was told. I wrote down how to bind a Bogart. Then, as the spook told the tale, I took notes, struggling to keep up as usual. As I already knew, binding a Bogart involved a lot of hard work, which the spook called laying. First, a pit had to be dug as close as possible to the roots of a large, mature tree. After all the digging the spook had made me do, I was surprised to learn that a spook rarely dug the pit himself. That was something only done in an absolute emergency. The rigor and his helper usually attended to it. Next, you had to employ a mason to cut a thick slab of stone to fit over the pit like a gravestone. It was very important that the stone be cut to size accurately so as to make a good seal. After you'd coated the lower edge of the stone and the inside of the pit with the mixture of iron, salt, and strong glue, it was time to get the boggart safely inside. That wasn't too difficult. Blood, milk, or a combination of the two worked every time. The really difficult bit was dropping the stone into position as it fed. Success depended on the quality of the help you hired. It was best to have a mason standing by and a couple of riggers using chains controlled from a wooden gantry placed above the pit so as to lower the stone down quickly and safely. That was the mistake that Billy Bradley made. It was late winter, and the weather was foul, and Billy was in a rush to get back to his warm bed, so he cut corners. He used local laborers who hadn't done that type of work before. The mason had gone off for his supper, promising to return within the hour, but Billy was impatient and couldn't wait. He got the boggart into the pit without too much trouble, but he ran into difficulties with the slab of stone. It was a wet night, and it slipped, trapping his left hand under its edge. The chain jammed so they couldn't lift the stone, and while the laborers struggled with it and one of them ran back to get the mason, the boggart, in a fury at being trapped under the stone, began to attack Billy's fingers. You see, it was one of the most dangerous boggarts of all, cattle rippers, that had got the taste for human blood. By the time the stone was lifted, almost half an hour had passed, and by then it was too late. The boggart had bitten off Billy's fingers as far down as the second knuckle and had been busily sucking the blood from his body. Billy's screams of pain had faded away to a whimper, and when they got his hand free, only his thumb was left. Soon afterward, he died of shock and loss of blood. It was a sad business, said the spook, and now he's buried under the hedge, just outside the churchyard at Leighton. Those who follow our trade don't get to rest their bones in hollowed ground. It happened just over a year ago, and if Billy had lived, I wouldn't be talking to you now, because he'd still be my apprentice. Poor Billy. He was a good lad, and he didn't deserve that. But it's a dangerous job, and if it's not done right... The spook looked at me sadly, then shrugged. Learn from it, lad. We need courage and patience, but above all, we never rush... We use our brains, we think carefully, then we do what has to be done. In the normal course of events, I never send an apprentice out on his own until his first year of training is over. 
Unless, of course, he added with a faint smile, he takes matters into his own hands. Then again, I've got to feel sure he's ready for it. Anyway, now it's time for your first Latin lesson. This ends disc three.